to say to you, the best is yet to come. This is prophetic. This is not just a encouraging word. This is a prophetic utterance. That's why I bring it to you forcefully and with purpose. The Lord says, the best is yet to come. John chapter 2 verse 10. Jesus went to the wedding at the Cana, Cana of Galilee. And there he turned the water into wine at his mother's request. John 2.10 says, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have drunk, have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. The governor of the feast is the one who is talking here, and he says this is not the way that it's done. You serve the poor wine until everybody gets a little affected by it, and then, uh, or you serve the good wine first, and then, then you save the best for last because everybody's affected and they don't know that the quality of the wine's going down. He said, but you've reversed that, which is only natural because the kingdom of God is upside down the world systems, or the world systems are upside down to the kingdom of God, shall I say. But the premise was you've saved the best for last, but that's God's M.O. God saves the best for last. I have here in, in my hand a plastic spoon that I took off the table over there. A young lady some years ago, the story was, uh, was passed around, that a young lady was a member of a church for several years, and she was taken ill and... Uh, very serious, and eventually she passed away. At her funeral, one of these was in her folded hands as she was in the coffin, a plastic spoon. Nobody gave explanation for it, but when the pastor got up to minister the eulogy, he said, many of you have questions about why our dear sister is holding a, a plastic spoon. He said, quite frankly, she asked that this be done because her testimony was that all through her years at the church, any time we ever had a gathering or a homecoming or a banquet or anything, some granny would always come around and say to her, now save your spoon because dessert is coming, and it's really good. So she wanted her testimony to be that her faith was that the best was yet to come. Which was, I felt like, a good, a good sign. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11 says this. I'm going to read to you from the Good News Translation. Thus saith the Lord, I alone know the plans I have for you. Plans to bring you prosperity and not disaster. Plans to bring about the future you hope for. That is a powerful, powerful statement. God says, I have things planned out for you. Me give you just a passing thought. Some years ago when Jesus walked the earth, a little IRS agent, a tax collector named Zacchaeus, was a man of short stature and as Jesus was passing by, he wanted to see him. And other taller people were blocking his view. And so as he followed along trying to get a glimpse of Jesus, he came to a tree and he climbed up that tree so that he could see Jesus. And when Jesus got to that point, he stopped and he looked up in the tree and said, 
Zacchaeus, he knew who he was. Zacchaeus, come down, for I must go to your house and have lunch with you today. Now my thought to you is this. Many years before Zacchaeus needed that tree on that day, somebody planted that seed. Does God plan ahead? And does he know the end from the beginning and the, the beginning from the end? Jesus said, I am the Alpha and Omega. What I'm saying to you is God has a purpose, a plan, a design for you. Miss Cassie and I were talking before we began, and I was telling her that I have been a Christian for 68 years. I got saved when I was nine years old. Gave my heart to God. I had no relative in that church service. It actually wasn't a church service. It was a tent meeting. And uh, I think it was, what, about 1954 or 55. And uh, it was a, a large tent, and several hundred people were gathered in that tent. Uh, and and uh, I, I asked an aunt to take me. I was nine years old. I asked the aunt to take me, the aunt, how do you say it, to take me to that meeting. I don't know why, but I did. And uh, Mom and Dad were working. And uh, she took me, and uh, I don't think she stayed. She just dropped me off. Back in those days, things were a little different than they are today. <laughs> and uh, the preacher got up and preached, and it made sense to me. And when he gave the altar call, I went down, knelt in those shavings, and honestly and sincerely gave my heart to God. So for 68 years now, I've been a Christian, and I've been in the Word of God. And as a teenager, I loved the Word and have, have loved it all of my life. I guess that's the reason, because the call of God was on my life when I didn't know it. And I said to Miss Cassie, I said, when you find out your calling is not when God calls you. He calls you before you ever find out. That tree was waiting on Zacchaeus when he got there. Nobody had to go out and get a ladder for him. There was a tree to climb that had been in the four thoughts of God. How meticulously does God plan? And if God plans, he knows what is coming. And I want to say to you that the best is yet to come because God has made plans for that. So... This is a word from God. I hope you take it as a prophetic personal word from God. It is. In Psalm chapter 84 and verse 6, Blessed is the man who passing through the valley of Baca makes it a well. Now I want to emphasize the word he's just passing through. He didn't come to stay. He's only passing through. Because baka in the Hebrew language means weeping. It's the valley of weeping. David said, yea, though I pass through the valley of the shadow of death. So there's all kinds of valleys in life to walk through. But do you know the definition of a valley? It's the low point between two mountain peaks. That's what a valley is. Now, that would indicate that there's twice as many mountaintops as there are valleys. Hello. This, this uh, scripture says, when you are going through some weeping, going through some hurting, going through some pain, just dig a well because there will be other people coming behind you and you'll turn the weeping valley into a valley of refreshment. David said in his valley, the shadow of death, that he restoreth my soul. Where? In that valley. As a matter of fact, Dottie Rambo even wrote a song that says, In the valley, he restoreth my soul. We all want to live on the mountaintop. We all want to live 
in the highest peak of our praise and worship and glory. I remember going to church when people would say, I'm going to get my blessing, which is okay. But how about, I'm going to be a blessing. How about that? It's sort of selfish to say, I'm going to get my blessing. Maybe we should say, let's all get our blessing. Because it sounds a little bit selfish if you say, I'm going to get my blessing. I understand the, the, the impetus behind that. But what I'm saying to you is that some things have to die in our lives to perfect us and make us better. Because you weren't born perfect. And God's still working on you. And sometimes those things that you get processed through are so some things can fall off of you. Hello. Matter of fact, not sometimes, a lot of times. The stuff that you encounter, the stuff that you experience, is God helping you to grow. Old wineskins have to die. So that new wineskins can hold the new wine. Does that make sense to you? We have a tendency to be religious in our nature. And that means we hold on to things that God has let go of. God does turn some things loose. Because their time is up. We need to know how to move with the cloud because God doesn't leave you stationary. He moves you. And the purpose for that is for advancement and growth and maturity and perfection so that your discernment can be fine-tuned. Make sense to you? Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego were thrown into a fiery furnace, which was a death sentence. That was to be an execution, a public execution by fiery furnace. They did not die. As a matter of fact, the only thing that happened to them was that their bindings got burned off in the process of passing through that furnace. They didn't stay there. They only passed through it. And God sent an angel to walk with them in the midst of their furnace. And when they came out, they came out and got promoted. Listen, God is at work in your life. And the best is yet to come. And we need to learn to let go of some things, to let some things shrivel up in our life and turn them loose and move on. Because they're only holding us back and they're only slowing us down and they don't belong there anymore and maybe never did. They didn't even smell like smoke when they came out of that furnace. They passed through the deadline. The ones that threw them in died. But they didn't. Why? The devil cannot follow you where God will lead you. He cannot. He found that out at the Red Sea. And the, and the lion's den. And the fire, he found that out. He can't go where God can take us. Psalm 23, verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. He goes on to say, that's where my soul gets restored. God prepares a banquet table in the presence of your enemies. How foreign is that to world's thinking? A banquet table in the presence of your enemies. And yet God is not intimidated by your enemies. And he doesn't want you to be. 
1 Corinthians 15, 36. Thou fool. This is Paul talking to the church. <laughs> thou fool. That which thou sowest is not quickened unless it die. Oh, some things you need to turn loose. You know, a farmer, if a farmer doesn't turn loose of that seed when he puts it in the ground, walk away and trust and trust the process, then he won't get a harvest. You have to turn that seed loose, and guess what that seed has to do? It has to die. It has to die. Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And Psalms is quick to tell us that if you sow in tears, you reap in joy. Notice the tears come first, but the joy is the last result. result. It comes last. God saves the best for last. And in your life, I'm telling you today, the Holy Spirit says that your best is yet to come. And you may be sitting there thinking, well, I'm too old now, or I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm too weak now, or I'm, I'm too frail now, or I'm too this or too that or too the other. I don't care what your argument is. If God says it, it's so. And your best is yet to come. God doesn't move by your age or by your physical condition. He does not consult your problems to call you or to lead you. God is not controlled by the obstacles. He moves past the obstacles and he'll move you past the obstacles. Sure it hurts. Sure there's tears. Sure you don't understand. Sure all of that is a part of life. And we want it now. We want it yesterday. Sure you do. But God knows exactly what he's doing. And he knows exactly the timing of when and how to do it. And your best is yet to come. First Corinthians fifteen fifty six is where God says, "Unless you let it die, it cannot be quickened." Job fourteen fourteen. If a man die, shall he live again? Job is the apostle of living past the deadline. Job was supposed to die. Satan thought he was going to kill him. He thought he could kill him, and he tried to kill him. But he just couldn't get it done. Sitting on an ash heap, scraping his sores with, with, with cinders, and dogs licking his wounds, three friends sitting there accusing him, his wife abandoning him, his children killed in a storm, all of his wealth gone, his dignity is gone, his reputation is gone, his influence is gone, he's lost everything. He might as well be dead. As a matter of fact, he said, I wish I'd never been born. Did that stop God? No. He brought him through it, took him past it, and blessed him more in the end than he was in the beginning. God knows how to shut the devil up. Uh -huh. And he saved the best for last. I hope you're listening because God's talking to you today. It might be coming out of my mouth and, and I'm not trying to be arrogant. And I'm not trying to be self-serving. I'm telling you, when the Holy Ghost speaks, you need to receive what He says. And He doesn't speak without reason. We have come through some times where hope has been lost. We've come through some times where churches were lost. Saints were lost. People have decided not to go back to church. We've come through some times where people have died in large numbers. And we've come through some times when people are discouraged and 
confused and in despair and broke. And they don't know what's ahead. They don't know how to navigate this. They don't know what's going on. But I want to tell you the Holy Ghost of heaven brought a message to this preacher to say to you, your best is yet to come. Job asked the question, if a man dies, shall he live again? And then he answered his own question. He lived again after the death sentence. When most men would have died, Job just didn't. He lived on. Sure, he had some ugly memories. He had some bad past experiences. We all do. But I want to tell you, God doesn't let that be the determining plumb line for your future. God does not ever consult your past to determine your future. First Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. We shall all be changed. Somebody said, well, it's in, in reference to the rapture. No, it's in, refer if it, it's in reference to life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everybody's not going to die. Some people are going to live on. There's going to come generations going to defeat death. They just won't die. The Lord will come and receive them unto himself. And death just... It's, it's an enemy, and it's going to lose the battle. Death is going to lose the battle. Do you know the only power death has is sin? Sin caused death. And when sin is dealt with, death is dealt with. <laughs> death can't get paid anymore. Because the wages of sin is death. And death won't get paid anymore. So they're going to go on strike. <laughs> Amen. Amen. We need to learn that God knows how to cause us to live past the deadlines. We're in a world of deadlines. The mortgage deadline. The bank deadline. The insurance deadline. The, the, the medical deadline, the governmental deadline, the, oh my God, the family deadline, the, 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 the relationship deadline. Life is full of deadlines that you're not supposed to survive, but you will. You do. You have. God has brought you this far. And you didn't come this far just to come this far. Turn around and look at somebody and say, you didn't come this far just to come this far. You didn't come this far just to come this far. The prodigal father had the statement, this my son was dead and is alive again. What was he saying? He was lost to me. He was gone. God restored him and brought him through it and brought him back. See, God don't take you through the valley to leave you in the valley. He takes you there to give you victory and to give you something that you didn't have when you went into that valley. Something you needed. Some element of your faith. Some element of your understanding and discernment. You're going to come out better than you went in. That's more than the devil can say. Joseph was left for dead by his brothers. They took his bloody clothes to his father. And his father thought he was dead. His mother thought he was dead. All of his brothers, after they left him for dead, they figured he was probably dead too after a certain point anyway. He 
just didn't die. He survived. He survived the pit. He survived the slave traders. He was sold to Potiphar and became a servant. This is the dreamer now. The man who had dreams given to him by God of how God was going to use him and how he was going to relate to his family. This man in the pit, in the chains, in the servitude. Now he's getting falsely accused by a woman that is deceitful. And her husband puts him in prison. He just keeps going down and down and down. And after a while, normal humanity says, this can't be the will of God. This can't be, this God can't, uh-uh. No, that I no, I quit. I quit. A lot of people have done that in the last two or three years. I quit. I can't see any benefit in going to it. I quit. Job didn't quit. Joseph didn't quit. He stayed faithful. Finally, through a process of being abused in prison where they said, yeah, yeah, pray for us and, 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 and help us to get out of here, you know, the butler and the cupbearer. And then when they did get out, he, you know, he dreamed a dream and told them what the dream was going to be. When they did get out, they forgot him. How many times have you been forgotten? How many times have you been dismissed? How many times have you just been negated, canceled, how many times have you been written off? How many times and how many people have just left you for dead? Joseph ends up finally, after all of the junk, second in command of the most powerful nation on the earth at that time. The director of finances. Guess what? God saved the best for last. He didn't give it to him in the middle. He, he waited for the last. We win. We win. We win. In the end, we win. Your best is yet to come. Isaac was under a death sentence because God said, take him up on the mountain and offer him as a sacrifice. That was a death sentence. Take him up there and offer him. They went three days journey, three days, third dimension. He found a, dis a mountain in the distance and Abraham recognized that's the place. They get off their animals and start up the hill. They've got the wood. They've got the fire. And here's old Abraham with a young Isaac. He's a young man now. He's a teenager. Much stronger than his father. Much younger and much more physically fit. And he says, Father, I see the wood. I see the fire. But where is the sacrifice? My son... God will provide himself a sacrifice. Well, now, Isaac was not stupid. He didn't see a sacrifice. The thought probably crossed his mind. You it, Jack. <laughs> it's you. They get up there, and things start happening that cannot be explained. He gets tied to the horns of the altar. Ooh, where's that sacrifice? Mm. He didn't struggle. He didn't object. He simply trusted his father. And more than that, he trusted his father's God. Abraham raised the knife. And by the time your daddy's standing over you with the knife raised, got you tied to the altar with the wood ready to light, your 
lightning fast mind's going to come to the conclusion that you're under a death sentence. It was a death sentence from God. Oh my, that's, that, that's horrible. A death sentence from God. And as he starts to come down, the angel called him twice, two times for emphasis. Abraham, Abraham, stop. He said, don't hurt the lad, for God now knows that he can trust you. And he turned, I don't know if to throw the knife down or to loose his son or whatever, but there was a ram caught in the Oh, there's a ram caught in the there's always a ram in the thicket, y'all. God always has a ram in the thicket. You don't see a way, but God's already got your answer somewhere tied to a stick or under a tree or under a rock. Somewhere God's got your answer. It's already there like Zacchaeus' tree. He wants you to trust him when you can't see the answer. Trust Him when you can't feel the answer. Trust Him when you can't figure out the answer. Just trust Him. In order to do that, you got to let some doubts fall off. Some fears fall off. Some, some ideas and philosophies fall off. Some religion's got to fall off. Something's got to die so your faith can live strong. ram was the sacrifice. It was the scripture that really speaks to me. On the way up the mountain, the Bible says, and they both went together. And they both went together. The father knowing what he'd been told to do and the, and the son not knowing what was coming. But they walked together. Some things had to drop off of Isaac at that point. He became a man that day. And he became a man of God that day. And Abraham became indeed the covenant partner that God trusted. And had Abraham not passed the test that day, there would not been a have been a Jesus Christ to save your sins. Because God's covenant partner had to give up his son so that God, the other half of that covenant, could give up his son. Mm. His covenant. Everything that's yours is mine, and everything that's mine is yours. It's called covenant. There was so much at stake, and the devil was trying to put a stop to it at every turn. But he couldn't because they trusted God. See, Isaac trusted God, and he trusted his father. Abraham trusted God explicitly and would have killed his own son. How much faith would that take? But the Bible says he'd already received Isaac raised from the dead. He believed, he believed with all of his heart that if he went ahead and did what God told him to do, that God would resurrect that boy. Oh my God, that's faith. I'm telling you, there was no doubts and fears that could that could pass through that kind of a fire. That, that stuff got burned off. That's the reason Abraham's the father of the faithful. Even to this day, nations call him their forefather. Why? Because he staggered not at the promise of God. Oh, oh, he staggered not at the promise. God said to you, I'm going to give you a seed, and 
your offspring, your descendants will be like the stars of the heaven and the sands of the sea. And you about to kill that boy because God said to do it. What does that do to your vision? What does that do to what you've been hoping for? It sounds like God changed his mind. God don't change his mind. He changes your mind. Okay, your best is yet to come. That was a form of resurrection. He was laid on the altar. The death sentence was passed. And the execution was in process. But all of a sudden, that's resurrection. No matter how you slice it, Abraham had already killed him in his heart. That's resurrection. See, resurrection is the end result of death for the believer. <laughs> yeah, though I pass through the valley, walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Your best is yet to come. A rich young ruler came to Jesus. What must I do to be saved? Keep the commandments. I've kept them from my youth. Go sell all that you have. Give it to the poor. Come and follow me. Boy, that threw a wet blanket on his hopes and dreams. He thought surely Jesus would be proud of him and, and pat him on the back and say, Oh, you're perfect. Rich, young, go sell it all, give it to the poor, come and follow me. There wasn't any of Jesus' disciples rich. None of them. This young man was told, give it up, give it up, give it all to God. And Jesus also added in there, take up your cross and follow me. Did you know that there was not ever an apostle that Jesus did not say, come and follow me? Except the one they elected, Matthias, after Judas went defunct. They elected Matthias. Matthias never anything because we don't ever have any record of anything that he did in the scriptures. I mean, he may have done some things that's not recorded. And he's probably a good man. But God does not move by vote. God sets up kings and takes down kings. God does not move by vote. Should we not vote? Yeah, you should vote. If you're in a democracy, you should vote. But that doesn't mean that God moves by vote. Okay, the rich young ruler. Follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. Jesus said, he didn't say it, but it, what that meant was, I want you to be my disciple. I want you to take Judas' place because he knew Judas was not going to be there. This young man passed up an opportunity to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. You might be reading some of his epistles today had he said yes instead of no. Matthias was not God's choice. Paul was. And Paul was called by Jesus himself on the road to Damascus. And he became the apostle to the Gentiles. This young man lost because he could not stay the course and trust God's goodness even when things looked bad. The bad times is when you need to trust God. You don't need to trust God in the good times. It's a good time. You need to trust God in the bad times. Some things got to fall off of us if we're going to grow. 
Some stuff died in Peter when he stood outside the hall of justice, denied that he even knew Christ and cursed. He was stricken in his soul and he went out, the Bible says, and he wept bitterly. Do you know that during that time some stuff was falling off of him right and left because all that stuff needed to be out of Peter so that a few days later on the day of Pentecost he could stand up and preach the gospel out of his righteousness. Faith becomes stronger when doubts and fears become weaker. God got no glory from Peter denying Christ. God doesn't send you trouble. God doesn't send you disease and, and trouble and hurt and pain. God doesn't send that. He doesn't need to send it. There's a devil that enjoys that. And he's trying to kill you. But God will take that and he will use it for your good and his glory. Because some stuff got to die in you. You thought, well, when I got saved, I became perfect. No, you didn't. You still ain't perfect. Neither am I. But thank God we got some hope. <laughs> We're moving in the right direction. Peter came back. God saved the best for last. John 16, 7. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come. These men had come to depend on Jesus. They had given their lives over to him. They left their, their vocations. They left their, their work. They left all of their, their family. They followed him day and night. And guess what? He said, now I got to go away. Their hopes were in Jesus. And rightly so. But he said, i got to go away. And what kind of a hurt did that leave for them? To watch him suffer and bleed and die and be buried. What did that do to these men? During that time, some of them showed their colors like Thomas. Now, I can't believe anymore. I'm going to have to be shown. I'm going to have to see. I can't just believe. i got to see it. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter cannot come. See, we think in the time of when God says, I I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to do this or, 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 or let you walk this path. And we, we center in on that instead of what God's plan for after. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter cannot come. See, the comforter came. He, he is the same spirit that was in Jesus. He's the Holy Spirit. And he come, and Jesus said, later he said, the works that I do shall ye do also, and greater works than these shall ye do, because I go to my Father. They could not have had a Pentecost. They could not have had a spirit infilling. They could not have a ministry. They could not have the great success unless they went through a period of time where Jesus was in a tomb. That was not pleasant. But it was necessary. And they didn't trust God like they needed to. But at least they didn't completely fail. Thomas almost failed. Jesus showed up and said, here, you need to see scars? Here they are. Touch them. He fell on his face. He didn't touch any scars. He fell on his face and cried out, my Lord and my God. He was raised to a new level. Out of what he went through, he was at a place he had never been before. Listen, keep your faith in God because God's saving the best for last. Amen. 
I don't care how dark it is. I don't care how little you have. I don't care what you have to sacrifice. I don't care what the threats and fears and doubts and all that that come. I don't care what the devil said. It does not matter about those things. Those are not your hope. Your hope is past the tunnel. It's past the light at the end of the tunnel. It's in Jesus Christ. You do not get discouraged when things are tough. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. Here's the John part. Lean not to thine own understanding. You got to quit trusting you. Your plan. You got to quit trusting your ability. You got to quit trusting the little few bucks you got. You got to quit trusting in your own understanding, in your own knowledge, in your own education, in your own ability. You got to lean on Him in all thy ways. Acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy path. Why? Because the best is the last. Some church folks didn't get that and they fell by the wayside because of things like COVID and, and, and regulations and mandates and all the crap that's come down the pipeline. They didn't make it. They didn't make it. Because they didn't understand that if you trust God, you trust God. Right. Your trust in God is not dependent upon whether everything's okay or not. Trust really, really counts when things don't look okay. 